Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you may be, everyone. We have a very wide and diverse group across many countries, and we're looking forward to presenting you with this webinar hosted by the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport North America, or SILTNA for short. My name is Colin Laughlin. I'm a member of SILTNA's Pacific chapter coming to you today from Vancouver, British Columbia on the west coast of Canada. For those of you who are not aware, SILT is a professional body in the supply chain, logistics and transport industry. With over 35,000 members in 37 countries, SILT's mission is to develop the art and science of logistics and transport through research, education, networking, and the sharing of ideas. Before we proceed, I would like to share some housekeeping items. Everyone in our audience is muted with your video off. Please do not unmute or turn your video on during our webinar. <clears throat> we encourage any questions you would like to put to our speakers and have time planned at the end of the webinar for a question and answer period. If you have a question, please use the chat feature on your Zoom screen and they will be collated during the webinar. If, you, if we have too many questions to answer in our planned hour, we will extend the question and answer period by up to 15 minutes. This event is being recorded and will be available for viewing on SILTNA's YouTube channel. After the webinar, we will send all attendees a feedback survey. Please take a minute, few minutes to complete it so we will know what you thought of this webinar. Your feedback ensures our webinars are here to serve you in getting the knowledge you need for your profession. Before I <clears throat> introduce our speakers, I would like to thank our sponsor, Global Container Terminals, GCT, headquartered in Vancouver, Canada. <clears throat> GCT Global Container Terminals, Inc operates four Green Marine certified terminals in two principal North American ports. Through GCT USA on the East Coast, the company operates two award-winning facilities, GCT New York and Staten Island, New York, and GCT Bayonne in New Jersey. On the West Coast, GCT Canada operates two gateway terminals, GCT Venturm and GCT Delta Port in Vancouver and Delta, British Columbia. I extend a hearty appreciation for their sponsorship of today's webinar. Our webinar today features three of the world's leading architects in the quest for a globally interoperable data system in international supply chains. Each of our speakers is a leading consultant to business and government in their private practices, and each is a leader in the development of open standards at the United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business, better known as UNCFACT, the Geneva-based center open to experts from around the world, contributing to standards for the realization of a global infra information infrastructure for trade, logistics, and transport. Our three presenters will approach our webinar topic achieving traceability, tracing and transparency in international supply chains with three interrelated component cases. David Roth on modernizing the core, Anand Besha on connecting the digital and physical realities, and Ian Watt on expanding the horizon. David Roth is UNCFAC Domain Coordinator for Transport and Logistics. David has brought the concept of a data pipeline to reality across much of Europe and will be our first speaker. Anand Besha is Vice Chair of UNCFAC, whose responsibilities include guiding its transport and logistics domain. Anand is also project lead in the Internet of Things program at the Amsterdam headquartered Digital Container Shipping Association and will be bringing us up to date on the latest actor in international cargo transportation a smart container and other important developments in digital technology. Ian Watt is UNCFAC Vice Chair for the International Supply Chain Domain. Ian will round out today's webinar telling us the next steps now required to bring to fruition the long desired goal of global interoperability of data systems. 
Ian will also explain how the COVID-19 pandemic has actually accelerated the work of the international community. As everyone is well aware, online meetings and webcasts such as this one have become the new norm for staying connected, but I'm sure everyone is eagerly looking forward to those all important face-to-face -face meetings when we can travel safely again. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, David Roth from Liverpool, England. David, as you're getting your screen prepared, I'm just going to mention that I recall a few years ago, you had developed an early stage data pipeline for supply chains of two large retailers in England. You are now the leading architect for transport data pipelines across much of Europe. Data, David, what is a data pipeline? The screen is yours. Thank you very much, Colin. And also thank you very much to Silna for the opportunity to speak about the role of data pipelines and um, in traceability and transparency in supply chains. And we'll also talk a little bit about the effect that COVID-19 has had um, in supply chains and digitalization in general. So Colin, hopefully I can answer the question as we go through. So uh, let's make a start. So the, the million dollar question is, what is a data pipeline? So it is essentially a electronic record of data about the goods and the movements that are built up within the supply chain. It's important that those uh, data snippets are provided at the various waypoints from the actor who knows them to be true uh, all too often in a uh, supply chain, we ask the wrong person for the information that's passed back and there's many parties involved. So it's really important that we take it from the true source of the data and also that people who need access to those data fields get access to perform their role within the supply chain. So on screen, we can see some typical waypoints which will look familiar for anybody moving goods and that doesn't matter if it's air, road, sea or rail. The, uh, the waypoints are, uh, prescriptive for the supply chain in use. So we're going to see some examples of this as we go through the presentation. So if we uh, move to the next slide, it's all about the right data from the right place at the right time. And this slide has been used uh, time over to demonstrate really different players within the supply chain, feeding data into that pipeline data exchange structure, the PDS, which was explored in uh, various European uh, union projects, um, Core and Cassandra and Celis. There were three EU projects set up to uh, explore the possibilities from advanced data from source and what impact that would make on the supply chain, in particular at the border. So from a frictionless border perspective, how good is information and how could we action that information a bit better? It's quite common to ask in the supply chain, we ask maybe the carrier to provide the HS code for the goods but they're only moving them, but it's the last person carrying those goods to get asked for, exam for that data. If we take a look at a, a live business case that was documented from the UK, and this was documented by the Port of Felixstowe and Port Health for uh, one government at the border. There was a uh, cases coming through Felixstowe where hazelnuts from Azerbaijan had a 100% document check and a 10% physical inspection requirement. So what was happening at the port and on the Bill of Laden, for example, everything was described as one container said to contain foodstuff, nuts, uh, or there was a short code on the manifest. So as a result, all nuts from Azerbaijan were stopped because the description wasn't clear enough. So something as simple as a description of goods uh, makes a big difference at the border. When they looked into this, they estimated a $1.5 million saving for this case alone. And one government at the border, which oversees all border activities at the time, estimated it to be around 10 times that saving across the UK. So the correct data actually helps borders uh, de-risk the trade routes and allows us to focus their resources on the unknown, so do more with less, essentially. So if we come back to our pipeline example, we can see uh, across this, it's all about the timing and availability of data. There's been numerous studies uh, presented where data, which confirm that data is more available the earlier uh, in the supply chain it's provided, it's timely and accurate. 
And as it approaches the destination uh, and the, the border in particular, uh, that data starts to get watered down. Merce did a, a study and there was around 30 parties involved in uh, a transaction moving a single container from Africa to Europe. So when we look at pipeline data side by side, we can see it's available much earlier. In some cases, the examples we had with the UK border agency, it was 25 to 30 days uh, earlier than what they were receiving it on a manifest. It was more accurate and they took the supply chain data from the pipeline into their risk targeting engine. And side by side, they could see the difference between the, the bill of lade and the manifest data and the supply chain data. And it allowed them to de-risk goods. There was 92% uh, of border officials confirmed that the data was much more useful from the pipeline than from the manifest. And now they're exploring what they can do with the timeliness of the data and how they can plan and um, trigger in indicators into the supply chain and ask for more information from that ecosystem. So it's split out into various waypoints in the EU projects and the UK pilot project. We demonstrated the first waypoint was when the goods were physically loaded and the second was when the vessel departed and the goods were on their way. The third was around the time that you would have to do your import customs declaration uh, and slightly ahead of the manifest being provided to the border officials. So if we take a look at a real world example, this is where a pipeline has been implemented in the recycling sector and um, they're asking the right person. So they ask the shipper, the exporter, for the information around the goods that are moving, the buyer, the seller, the correct HS codes. Then those goods start their transport journey. And if we take a look at the waypoints on screen, when the goods are loaded out, it's a weight based uh, transaction. When the goods are completed loading, that information is provided by the load site into the pipeline, which enables the pipeline to action that data. So once we've got a completed load, we've got the container number, we've got the seal number, we've got the weights, and we can submit the verified gross mass, the VGM, which needs to be provided to the port uh, and the carrier. We also then have enough information from the exporter and the load site to submit the export customs declaration from the UK. So that is part of this process as well. So nobody's having to do customs declarations. And we can verify when these events took place and attest to that data. The information is coming from source. And then you can see further down, other snippets come into that, that pipeline. We get the Weybridge tickets provided from the, the Weybridge electronically. We produce an Annex 7 in this case, which is a regulatory document that has to travel with the goods. And the same with customs, we have an accompanying document. And then the photos come in and they attach to that loading record. So from this example here, we can see that we can action trusted data from the true source because we can attest to it and we can use that information to drive in the supply chain. So hopefully that gives an example in, in this case of where you could use this information in your own supply chains to automate and reduce the handover of paper. So in real terms, what are the benefits of data pipelines? And um, typically it's identifying risk in the supply chain and minimizing that risk. So you know when things are not going as planned because you're getting early indicators throughout the movement of those goods. You can manage on exception through the use of data rather than managing as a rule. It also allows you, if you're an importer, to hold a lower stock holding which improves cash flow and also manage your unit price when you purchase for a, a price. Uh, as it moves through the transport chain, you don't want to experience unexpected costs. So you want to protect your margin and identify where you have got leakage on that unit price. And um, examples in the UK and the European Union, they've both included data pipeline principles within their customs and border papers. So that's how they're going to work going forward, 2025 and 2040. They're aiming towards uh, data as an enabler. And also the data pipeline acts as a single source of truth. So if we take a little look now around how COVID-19 has affected uh, digitalization projects, what we've found is it's accelerated projects. People are working from home. They've identified that they don't need all of the paper on the desk because people weren't prepared to have it in the house. And they've had to look at other ways of working. 
So we've noticed there's been a massive acceleration. People don't want the paper. They want to work smarter because they've been forced into a different way of working. So we worked on a uh, project uh, with various UN agencies, the outputs of which are available on the website on screen, the untc.org. And this project was all around COVID and reducing the paper that's handed over within the supply chain. There's various projects that are underway um, in the Baltic and Black Sea areas uh, throughout the European Union. And if anybody's interested in more details around this, I'm happy to provide those after the, the webinar. So as we went through that process, um, we took the UNC FACT multimodal transport data reference model, so known as MNT, so multimodal transport. And this is essentially a, a semantic base that um, we're using today and many of you will be using when you use shipping instructions, booking messages, uh, in Edifact messages to your supply chain network. Those are using the underlying multimodal transport reference data model. So we have a business name, we've aligned across all modes of transport. So if we take a look through there, we can see that the ZECMR, which is to do with road uh, in the UK and Europe, and, and also in um, the Arab countries, we can see Maritime Bill of Lading. We see the uh, DCSA, uh, Bolero, Ipska, have all involved this work within their uh, projects. We've got the rail uh, consignment notes and the wagon lists, which are underway, and there's a lot of work in that area in particular. Uh, we can see inland waterways, which is quite heavily used in Europe as well, and also the FIATA Bill of Lading, FIATA have standardised on using that UNC FACT multimodal transport data reference model. So this analysis of which field in which uh, business name and which mode of transport is available also on that website. So there's some future work that's going on within UNC FACT. Um, everyone talks about EDIFACT, but there's a lot of work around uh, JSON, APIs and JSON-LD. So there's a web vocabulary, uh, which is available online on the UNECE website. So the, for those who are non-technical, JSON-LD, is linked to data. So it allows us to identify um, what data means in its, um, in its own domain. If we search for a recipe for apple pie, for example, we'll see on Google there's several pictures with recipes and cooking times, and it's because it's using linked data. So we're doing essentially the same here for transport data. So this will be available in a repeatable way. So as things change, as standards change, uh, you will be able to get this information out from the UNECU website. So it'll really drive API development and, and also allow us to work to one set of shipping instructions rather than a set of shipping instructions, uh, implementation instructions per vendor. So this is something that we're really keen on standardizing how we interact with the supply chain. So these data structures are in place uh, already, probably within your business for book shipping instructions, tracking messages, Vermas, for example. The European Union have got a, a digital transport and logistics forum. So uh, there's around 120 experts who sit on that, that forum. Uh, myself and a few others on the call are, are involved in this. And it's about advising the commission and DG move around legislation. And they've got two real defined priorities. The first is harmonizing the regulatory environment. And they've created something called the FT, which is the Electronic Freight Transport Information Regulation. This essentially allows traders the right to present data at any border in the EU instead of documents. This is a massive step forward and it's something that could work elsewhere. Um, there'll be a few basic tenants to that, but um, it's pretty straightforward. They're also creating a, a European data sharing infrastructure which um, really is a bit like your mobile phone. You should be able to plug and play to connect. It's technology independent, so it's not swayed one way or another by a, a specific technology. It should allow interoperability between platforms and um, it should have a layer of security and governance. So this work is all underway in the EU. And what we can see there is um, in around 20 months time, this will become uh, law where we can actually use this so some interesting work they're going ahead for digitalization. If we take a little look at this, this slide's been used again numerous times to explain this data sharing infrastructure. 
And what we can see here is looks pretty familiar around pipeline concepts, various actors involved, an underlying data structure. And we can see there the API entry points uh, into that data sharing architecture. The APIs are essentially a, a way that the machines talk for those who are non-technical, means application programming interface, but essentially it allows machines to talk together and know what they mean when they're exchanging data. So we can see then people can plug in their API into that architecture and others within the architecture will be authenticated and can choose to use that API as well. So really that's some of the work that's been going on uh, around data pipelines in the UK and the EU, and it's working well. And we can see that these concepts are making their way into government papers and also uh, future thinking is now becoming more of a, a reality. So it's working well there. It could work very well elsewhere. So if anybody's interested in more information around data pipelines, please feel free to reach out to the contact details on screen. I'm also available to talk about the work that we've done on the pandemic and the COVID-19 work within UNCFACT. And also, uh, if anybody is interested, I can steer you in the right direction or give more information around work that's taking place in the EU. If you deal with the EU, you will be able to take advantage of those data sharing initiatives that are underway. So, Colin, I'd just like to hand back. I believe we're taking questions at the end, but thank you very much for the, for the time to speak. Thank you. David, thank you for that uh, very comprehensive overview. Um, I know that the concept of a data pipeline will be new to many people. And for those of you who have heard about it, uh, you've given some very valuable uh, details about how it operates. I'm going to ask you now to stop share on your screen so Hanan can set up her slides. And just as we're getting prepared to hear from Hanan, <clears throat> I'm going to have to, uh, I feel Hanan, I have to tell our international audience that I know you are really a product of Canada and you completed your PhD uh, in electrical engineering computer science at the University of Ottawa. Now, no one can blame you for residing in a lovely, lovely city of X in the south of France, but don't forget to come back and visit your Canadian friends as well. And then I can't think of anyone more experienced than you are to talk about smart containers, a concept you've been involved with since its early development and other fascinating innovations in supply chain data that contributes to logistics excellence. The screen is yours. And Anne, I think you may be on, on mute. Uh, I did unmute. mute, could you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Colin, for this nice uh, presentation. Uh, proud to be Canadian. Thank you as well for organizing this uh, webinar. Glad uh, to be here to share more uh, about connecting digital and physical realities. So, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of this little, uh, oops. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Could you still see the screen? I'm sorry for this. Yeah? Yeah, I can see it. Thank you. So today we'll be presenting the transparency of the supply chain. Um, it's all about uh, innovation and uh, what it's needed to make uh, sure that we could increase efficiency resiliency and sustainability of the supply chain. I would like to uh, present the smart container concept and solutions. Uh, this capacity to provide physical reliable data and to ensure that we have uh, IoT based end to end visibility. And I would like as well to present uh, quickly the UNC fact smart container pro project deliverables and achievement. On the top of the smart container, uh would like to talk about the cross-industry multimodal track and trace and this capacity to, to track and trace regardless which mode of transport is used and uh, share with you uh, an active project called UNC fact supply chain called cross-industry track and trace definitely when it comes to innovation it's not about just simply uh, what we call paving the code which is we don't really just have to make digital what we have already. We have really to think about uh, 
the processes again, and uh, we don't just automate them as they are. Uh, we have an opportunity to, re to rethink about the process and see how it could be um, enhanced, especially when we have other source of data, like smart container data, for example, with all this emerging IoT uh, devices, etc. So uh, a smart container, it's very simple. It's any type of container, or it could be even uh, other unit, logistic units that are equipped with an IoT device. An IoT device, uh, it has a couple of uh, sensors or probably much more. The idea is to be able to, phys to measure physical parameters and to be able to communicate them remotely with the outside world. So the smart container will be able to tell us about the journey of the container. So the GPS position, for example, where is my container? Answering that particular question or the set of sensors to be able to answer the question under which conditions the goods have been moving. As it is today, if we don't have a smart container, if we have only silent regular containers, there is no single player of the logistic chain has a granular view, door to door, uh, track, trace, telling us what is happening at each time. So having that IoT data, having the smart container, will be having an evidence of the execution of the trip and will be able to uh, compare that paper document and this information that we have been add, adding in that pipeline with the physical uh, trip execution. In addition, if we, if we know exactly what happened to that container at that particular uh, location, we are able to delineate in the responsibilities of the different players. As it is now, we have more than 40 players involved in one door-to-door -door trip. Uh, definitely IoT container data, smart container data is a good candidate for the data pipeline that just David presented. In terms of data flow, so we have this uh, IoT device installed paired with the container. Some of the capabilities of the smart container being able to have the location, GPS position, uh, being able to detect the motion and shocks, any door opening could be detected as well. Ambient temperature, if we have uh, that type of sensor. Uh, we could have a different set of sensors inside of the container, but able to communicate with the outside world via the IoT device, via the smart container device. So if we're talking about the recycling, probably we're interested in having the humidity measurement. If you are talking about some um, temper temperature sensitive product that are not carried on in a reefer, probably would like to have some temperature sensor inside of the cargo or inside of the container. So the smart container will be measuring this physical data, will be using different communication capability to communicate that with the outside world, and then sharing that with different clouds. It could be the cloud of the device owner, of the, de the device manufacturer. And at a certain point, we can imagine a lot of use cases and a lot of um, usage of that smart container data. In that sense, the smart container data will be generated once and shared as many times as it's needed. Just to give you a quick, quick idea about the value of having that visibility. If you are really a beneficial cargo owner, you will be having the capacity to master your supply chain, which means you will be able to reduce, for example, your stock because you know exactly when your uh, goods will be arriving at that final place of destination and you don't have uh, to have use a buffer. If you would like really to make sure that you control and you have an idea about the condition uh, of transportation of your goods, you'll be able to enhance your cargo quality. If you have some um, temperature sensitive, I don't know, it could be tobacco, it could be wine, it could be uh, even a cleaning product, something that could be damaged, but still you don't want to carry that in a reefer. Uh, basically, you will be able to adapt the route, adapt the packaging, make sure that you will be reducing loss of goods. Uh, if you have the right door opening detection, you will be able to know exactly when and who was responsible for that door opening that happened somewhere in the middle of nowhere, highway uh, area, etc. So you will be able as well to reduce that uh, 
that uh, all these steps, etc. In terms of insurance, you will be able to prove what happened to your container and when that happened, whether the quality uh, got impacted by that temperature change, by that transportation or not. Uh, same thing. Uh, smart container offer a lot for uh, small medium enterprises in the sense that you could enhance, accelerate all this uh, payment release, and you will be having a better cash management. And definitely for the cross-border agencies, customs that not only, they will be having more targeted inspections. If we know that that cargo um, got stopped in very weird areas, so probably would like to inspect that particular cargo. You will be having evidence of the route that was used for that particular transport and the point of origin as well. So there is much more factual, reliable data to enhance decision-making, including those made by the cross-border agencies. Uh, again, uh, we can argue that we have a lot of data and uh, we don't have no idea what to do with the data. And uh, at the end, you'd like to have your container and that's it. Uh, the idea of the smart container, it's really to go beyond the business as usual. Whenever there's something really to be uh, handled, you need to make a decision, you need to adjust your uh, plans. Uh, we need to, to give some smartness to that data. Basically, you need uh, to have the tools, policies, engines, whatever you call them, to be able to differentiate between uh, business as usual, regu regular measurement events within the acceptable uh, threshold versus you are having alerts that you have ready to react. Uh, if you add more some data science, etc., some business intelligence, some artificial intelligence, you end up having some predictive services. So it's not just about having the alerts and having something to handle. It's about as well enhancing your decisions on the long run based on your historical, historical data. You, you know what could be happening there and how to react. So when we talk about the IoT uh, data or the smart container data, it's, you're basically being able to make a digital twin. A digital twin is really a representation of what's happening in the physical world. You are not taking a picture of your trip. You are not uh, simply filling some data about it. You will be having a set of data really representing uh, timestamp data, geolocated data with different types of measurement. So having that uh, representation of your physical trip, that will increase your situa uh, situational awareness. That will increase and enhance your decision-making, well-informed decision-making. Definitely, historical data will be uh, interesting. Fusing, merging, getting other data streams into that uh, will be enhancing as well uh, your decision-making. And the digital twin, it will be more uh, data that will show you the, the physical trip execution and helping you to reach a better uh, decision-making and enhancing the model of your decisions. You have seen already this slide presented by David. Uh, when we talk about smart container, smart container to data to be easily integrated and used by different uh, players, it's very important to have that message in standards format. So all the players could consume the data if they have the right to, to consume it and enhance their processes by having that extra source of uh, digital, one of digital streams. And the idea is to be able to interpret the data the right way, the same way. So you don't really have to develop a different API for different players or stakeholders. So definitely having that standardized smart container data is key for the whole sub smart supply chain, uh, fast integration, easier integration based on standards. And that was the scope of one project that we did carry, carry on in UNC Fact. Uh, we would like you to make sure that you are not working in silos when, when it comes to different uh, transportation modes. We'd like to make sure that we are enhancing the collaboration using standards and making uh, sure that we have that interoperability. So the idea here is really to be able to uh, have that um, multi-model view and the container by default are multi-model. Hence the IoT smart container data, it's uh, multi-model without making any efforts. But when it comes to the track and trace cross industry supply chain, when it comes to consolidating deconsolidating different uh, cargo, sharing the same uh, container, etc. There is more efforts to be made to make sure that we have that uh, multimodal view. And as we talk, there is a lot of collaborations going from different organizations, uh, Digital Container Shipping Association, 
from the maritime uh, domain, IATA for the um, air cargo, uh, UN Act. All these organizations are working together and you are re really um, making sure that we have a transition from the standards adopted by individual transport mode to multimodal efforts. Uh, so the information is not simply searchable, available, and interpreted the, the right way, but really there is a link between the different transportation modes and the different uh, data to be carried on. And uh, David, again, did show that nice Excel file showing you that there is a mapping to be taken into account between different modes of transportation uh, that we have to work on, on to make sure that we have really multimodal track and trace and visibility. So um, for the USC fact cross industry supply chain track and trace project, we really would like to make sure that we are able to say, where is my product at any time? So we are going one step uh, compared to the smart container that you are asking or answering, where is my container? Here, it's really about the product. And basically you are enabling tracking and tracing of the products, could be as well the assets, and making sure that we have information sharing in standards electronic format. Uh, this is an UNC fact active project. Literally all the IoT providers uh, involved in it, uh, different uh, stakeholders involved in it, and a very successful uh, project attracting a lot of attention. Uh, we are defining really use cases to explain the data that will be generated and captured concerning the products and other trade items. So it's very, very granular in terms of track and trace. And there is a link between the product itself, the pallet, the container, or even the ship that's really carrying that particular product. And the idea really is to be able to track and trace any traded and identified item. So here, uh, identifiers are really key uh, for the transport equipment, for the products as well. We, did, we do cover the logistic services between really the seller to the buyer, which, is mean, which, which means really door to door tracking and tracing. Uh, so far, we did work on uh, a green paper. We did compile different concepts, scenarios, use cases for all prim primary mode of transport. We have like 82 pages. This was a very informal information gathering phase, uh, very free format. So all the ideas are uh, compiled and included in this uh, green paper. And we did a lot of efforts to make sure that we cut down and summarize this uh, information gathered during this phase to a white paper, which is more or less 20 pages. Uh, the title of this white paper is Integrated Track and Trace for Multimodal Transportation. Uh, this white paper is almost out. Uh, it's really uh, about to be uh, approved, presented in the UNC track plan in April 2021. So in a month from now. Next step, we'll be working on the business requirement specification, which is basically detailing the business processes of the cross industry track and trace. So it's really, we'll be reviewing all these cases that we did um, gather in the first phase and making sure that we have a clear understanding of the required data elements for uh, a particular use case. And we make sure that we have a message structure for the business interactions and the external schemas like any other um, project at uh, UNC Fact, the same concept. I would like to have that UNC fact is a very inclusive collaborative environment. So anyone could become expert, anyone could join and help and contribute to this standards development. And it's very open development process, which means, what means open development process? Uh, basically, all the experts could part will participate on their own capacity. So they really respect themselves and not necessarily the company that they work for. All the UNC facts uh, experts have to respect the relevant IPR policies. All the work that we do with UNC fact is donated to UNC fact and could be used uh, by the all the stakeholders that are interested in that standards for free. UNC fact is very collaborative environment in the sense that we are now over than a thousand public and private sector uh, experts and we, uh, everything is available on the queue, uh, etc. If you need more information about UNC FACT and how to become UNC FACT and how to join this effort, you can either contact me uh, by email or you have the email address as well of Lance Thompson that you can di contact directly, Secretariat of the UNC FACT. I would like to highlight that uh, there is a new discipline emerging, uh, maritime informatics it's known now as a new applied science. 
uh, I, we just contributed personally in this uh, book, Maritime Informatics. We did contribute two chapters. A good focus on the importance on the standards and the standardized digital data sharing through cargo chain. And uh, we have more than 81 co-authors from 20 uh, different countries involved in this work. And really nice chapters about efficiency, safety, resiliency, and sustainability in the maritime uh, transport. Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, feel free to contact me uh, and uh, via my email. Otherwise, uh, you can as well contact me via my LinkedIn um, account. Thank you, Hanan. That was <clears throat> a wonderful overview of uh, how the Internet of Things is going to play a big role in putting data into the uh, data pipeline, particularly smart containers. If you will now just stop sharing your screen, I'll ask Ian to set up his slides. And just while he's doing that, I want to mention Ian, <clears throat> I think it would be fair to describe you as the elder statesman in this ambitious undertaking for global interoperability of data systems around the world. Much of what has been achieved to date can be traced back to more than 25 years of your hard work. Hard work in the international uh, open standards development following a highly successful career designing international information systems for two very large multinational corporations, you decided to turn your attention to designing a system that would also facilitate transportation and logistics for small and medium-sized traders as well. Ian, where are we now? Where are we going? And how do we get there? The screen is yours. So you're seeing the screen? Yes. Okay. Well, hello everybody. Um, I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Australia. So those quickly on the maths would realize it's about 4 a.m. over here. I want to thank Siltner and Colin for bringing us together. And I particularly want to thank David and Hanane. We've worked for some time pulling all this together and it's been, uh, what, uh, it's, it's been quite an exercise. Uh, my job is to uh, pick up on what David and Hanane have talked about and to consider it not from a technical perspective, but to consider it from a management perspective. The first thing that we need to do is just reflect back um, just what is an API, this programming inter programming application programming interface that David spoke of, and it appears on many diagrams. Sounds a bit complex, but it's just an interface between two pieces of software that are communicating uh, and possibly even between machines. Application program APIs, a description here as to what we're actually talking about to make life a bit easier. Now, uh, in Hanane's presentation, you saw her mention avoid paving the cow. What I want to talk to you about here is that we're really at the point in this journey where with the technology and the standards and so forth, and you saw the benefits that were described by David and Hanane in particular as to what can happen. But really, we now need management to take a huge role in this. Um, and I'll explain that in a, a little bit more detail. Um, what I'm putting this slide up to virtually bring to us the idea that we've really got to rethink how we do things um, with these new opportunities we're seeing. Otherwise, we're going to just patch things up and not get the real benefit. And from my personal experience of 50 years of uh, in the software side of things, uh, it's worth taking the time to make things elegant and simple, and that's more difficult to do than, uh, than just taking a quick cut at it. So we're going to talk this through as to what maybe we should be doing. Now, we've um, seen David talking about um, the pipelines and uh, Hanane talking about the digital twins. And we can also observe that the World Customs Organization, in terms of seeking to see transparent borders and so forth, is structuring its thoughts very much around the way we've structured this presentation or this webinar. So in terms of modernizing the core, um, David spoke about typically uh, picking up the events as they occur, uh, determining the data where generated by whom, and then tapping into it to use it during the journey. That sounds very much like what David described. And when we come down to the next piece, connecting the digital and physical realities, digital twins, we're now talking about the data moving into the pipelines captured from the physical things that are moving along and being able to understand what's happening. And as Hanane was pointing out, not only just 
do things as we did, but to be able to simulate processes and so forth and improve things going forward. So I'm going to suggest to you that we need to consider these aspects of what we've achieved so far as being technical and standards based. And I think the two demonstrations, the presentations before mine indicated that we're well down that road. What I'm going to suggest to you is that the expanding of the horizons is really a sponsorship and culture change. And I'll go into that a wee bit more in a, in a minute. But it means identifying the opportunities for collaboration, data sharing opportunities across the ecosystems. Now, data sharing is a sounding like a very scary thing because when I speak to people, they say, oh, we've got to put data up there. People will see stuff about our business. We don't really want to know about that. Um, let's have a conversation about just in a couple of minutes as I move down through this presentation. Now, what I'm going to do is share with you some of my personal experience. Um, I did start writing software in 1969. So I'm one of those who was very lucky to start before there was anything notion about software, no packages and so forth. And over the first 20 years between 1970 and 1980 through 1985, we built what was known as material requirements planning systems or ERPs, enterprise resource planning, which started to look more at things like capacity of equipment to manufacture and not just the getting of the goods just in time. But by mid eighties, both of these had really failed to create mass adoption. And in the auto trade where I did a lot of work, um, there was the Kanban and various other mechanisms coming out of uh, Asia and uh, America, Australia and others uh, had to do respond to that. And they started to look at getting their pipelines or their supply chains in order. But to do that, they needed to change the culture. So the challenge was not to go and talk to the IT department about building more technology. It was really to go and talk to the HR department about how do we reshape this organization to take advantage of the technology. Now in the period 96 through to 2020, we've had another cycle of uh, developments, and this is about digitalization. So first of all, in the first era of uh, the 70s onwards, we digitalized on mainframes and minis and desktops and green screen networks. We digitalized what was there and replicated it on the computerized system for great benefit in terms of return on investment. This time we've got digitalization, the internet, the cloud, and all these sort of things. And what that's going to mean is that we now need to move to collaboration. We've got the technology, the pipelines that David spoke about and the technology of the digital twins that Hanane talked about. And we now have this idea that we're going to be able to get great traceability and transparency and artificial intelligence will enhance, enhance how we go forward. But that won't happen unless we're prepared to change how we do things and we're prepared to do a great deal to improve the quality of the data that's going through these pipelines. That's what we want to talk about. So to give us a metaphor, um, this is a city, it could be any city. It could be not only a city, it could be a regional area. So on the bottom left of my diagram here, I've got the suburbs and that's where things get actually made. That's where the siloed systems exist and that's where everybody's working. And we've done that for eons. In the rep top right, we've got the city corporate center and so forth. And what we've done in the, in the recent times is we've built freeways across our cities. Now we're pushing B doubles and other things across that. So this is the carrying of the physical goods. And this goes out through our freeways and whatever, and but it doesn't matter whether it's um, on, on road or rail or whatever. Now we didn't attempt to go and fix up the suburbs to get the big B doubles through or whatever. And we didn't uh, make much change there. So what we do have is on ramps and off ramps onto those freeways for getting the goods that need to go there, um, up there and off again. Now that gives us the impression or the knowledge that a lot of the stuff that goes on that freeway is not known at all on the freeway. It's all kept in the businesses down below. So what this metaphor is basically talking about is that we built a freeway to carry our goods. We now got a digital freeway to carry the data associated with that. And we should probably take the same approach if not trying to reinvent all the silos and all the things that are in the suburbs or in the cities, but just put these freeways in place. And that's where the pipeline comes into play. Now, David showed us this um, waypoints and the data moving through that. That all makes a lot of sense. And I think we're all comfortable with that. But where we've had paper 
exchange between the silos to make the trade move forward. We're now going to do that digitally. And as David pointed out, we'll pick up the data from the originator and reuse it where required. But Hanane introduced a new actor into this being the digital, the digital twin, bringing data into the pipeline as well. And this is a major breakthrough. And any of us who've worked on projects, early projects on pipelines and so forth in Asia and so forth, where we've been moving goods around, basically produce, it's all very well getting it through customs clearance and everything else. But if you can't guarantee that the goods were protected in terms of temperature and so forth, you've still got confusion and losses and disappointment. So it's very important to have all of these things come together. Now, Hanain mentioned that we have a project at CFACT, which has been this integrated track and trace, the thing with the 82 pages for the green paper to understand what's going on there, and the 20 page um, um, white paper that is going forward to the plenary for international release. But what we understood, there is no proven global standardized approaches to link all the data between the trade transport domains in all situations. So what this means is that from the point of there being an order to shift some good, to buy, to sell some goods to somebody and all of the ordering services for the service providers to move it there, there is no great big glider clip in the, in the, glider clip in the sky to hang all of those transactions to. Now this is a problem that we can fix, but it's a problem that is going to cause us issues until we actually can address it. So given the advent of collaboration over pipelines and inclusion of IoT and as society progresses beyond data interfaces between silos, it may be time to revisit and reconsider the candidate mechanisms such as the WC unique containment reference number and other evolving mechanisms such as GS1's link data and resolver approach. Now, if I focus for a minute on the WCA unique cons consignment reference number, I did some studies on this when it first came out about 15 years ago. And if it had to operate inside across silos, it was pretty tough ask to get that to work. But something like this, when we've now got these pipelines, may be worth go back and revisiting because we're going to have to find some sort of a mechanism like this to bring things forward. Now, there's a great advantage in doing this when people start talking about pipelines and sharing data in the pipeline and getting concerned about overexposure of data, let's break that down into two parts. The tracking is an operational exercise. It's monitoring through what David showed you in the pipelines and what Hanane had in the, um, the smart containers. It's the operational matter of getting something to the other end in the good condition. Traceability is the reverse and it's becoming more a legislative requirement of the ability to prove where did something come from, who handled it, uh, what conditions was it produced, sustainable development goals and all various other things like that. Now, if you don't have a mechanism that you can, um, like this, something like the unique consignment reference number or whatever, you're probably forced to put more data into the pipeline than you would like to, because it may be needed for a traceability situation. But if you have a high level key, that data could remain in my diagram of the city down in the suburbs. The data could stay in the appropriate siloed company and only drawn out when it is needed. That's very similar to how we do it in the paper-based system today. If there's a problem on recall or whatever, you end up with the company and they go into their paper records and find what's going on. So I'm suggesting that there is great value in finding an, an approach to solving this problem of some form of global recognized approach to link all the data across the multimodal transport. Now, if we go a little deeper into what David was looking at in terms of pipelines, and we start looking at a pipeline with all the players involved. So here you can see we've got the regulatory authorities, we've got the importer and the exporter, we've got the standards, which are terribly important, and we've got everybody from the financier to the carriers, the freight forwarders, and we've got um, Hanane with her IoT and the smart container down there pumping data in as well. That's a big picture of everybody that needs to be there. Now, before you can get going on any of this though, let's just assume that we're going to shift some wine from here from Australia across over to, uh, to Europe. We need to identify the, the entities that are involved. We need to identify the locations, the people the ser and services. And this is something that needs to happen 
such that when we're dealing with blockchain and other technologies that help us tr form trust, we need to know that the data we're trusting is actually correct in the first place. We need to manage the master data. We need to ensure that the data we hold in our master files around products matches the barcodes or whatever else digital mechanisms that we have on the physical goods, such that the IoT device is actually capturing data that, that matches the master data that is driving everything forward. We then have the concept of trader um, service agreement provisions. This is where before two traders start, they need to establish what they're moving, what INCO terms, what commodity codes and so forth. And that all needs to be tidied up and managed properly as well. Once you get to there, you're then able to place the order and shoot the goods and put in place all the services. And that's where David was pointing out as the services are executed, the data is picked up by the persons who originated that data and used by the others to move this thing forward. Now, when you sit and listen to people and you're talking in large work sessions and whatever, everyone wants to know the return on investment on all of this. Now, surely there is a return on investment in moving paper and getting things digital and having less mistakes. But there's another value proposition coming down and it gets back to what David and Hanane were talking about is about less stock in the pipeline at any point in time and optimizing stocks because you can trust the movement of the goods through the, the, um, the, through the supply chain. All sounds very complex. UNC Fact has for since about 2002 had this particular model and it's broken things down into the buy ship pay and within that, we've got the various regulatory and transport and procedures that are there. And CFACT has then set about creating semantic hub for standardization, simple, transparent, effective processes for global business. David was talking to a bit about that. The BRS stuff that uh, Hanane was talking about helps with that. There's recommendations and guidelines. And then there's this whole means, this public-private partnership of over a thousand exports experts meeting and doing this work and pushing all this stuff through and getting it out there for society. But society's got to pick this up and use it. And this is where we stand today. So if I take David, the diagram you saw David do, and uh, Hanain, and I want to thank uh, somebody I know on this, who's on this call, Rudy Hilmers from uh, Luxembourg, because Rudy is one of the, the architects behind this diagram. But if you look at what this diagram is showing, Hanane had down in the bottom right-hand corner, left-hand corner rather, how the smart container was pumping data into the pipeline. David has spoken about the APIs and the various modes of transport. We've got the government over on the right-hand side and the government agencies all sharing in this thing. If you put your mind to what we're looking at here in the diagram that, uh, that Rudy and others have put together for us, and we start looking at this diagram up here of the city, then you can see the APIs are really just those entries on and off the physical ramps of the, of the freeway for the physical goods. And now floating above that, we've got the pipeline of the digital, the same, cap same model going on. So I'm suggesting to you that that's maybe how we need to look at this. So that's all very well. We've had a good conversation about many things. We've talked about the modernizing of the core. We've talked about the digital reality of uh, digital twins. And we've talked about expanding the horizon. Now, what I'm going to suggest here is that we need now to move this whole idea into the boardroom. And my observations of life as a technical person who's moved somewhat into the boardroom is that things to do with logistics are seen as an operational level exercise. And it's not maybe getting the attention that the strategic level that needs to be there. And I'm going to suggest that we possibly need, and possibly CILT is the kind of organization that could count to consider this, is that we really need a director of trade digitalization and process change. This gets back to an old situation that I mentioned of, uh, uh, in the mid eighties, late early nineties, where we had to do a culture change to get material requirements planning, ERP working properly in businesses and move that forward. I think we've reached that point again. So that would be my call to action that we are at the point where we need to do something to take advantage of what David and Hanane and all these other efforts that have been going on are showing us. And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you to thank you for listening and hand back to Colin. Thank you, Ian. And if you will just uh, close your share screen now, we can start taking questions. 
let's add about 10 minutes to our allotted time. We're a little bit over now, but I think that uh, I saw quite a number of questions coming into the chat room and some of them have already been answered um, in the chat. Before, while people are just lining up their questions, Ian, um, just have to return to a phrase that I heard both you and Hanan use, and it's the first time I've heard it, paving the cow. Uh, what, uh, again, I think it was explained that that means repeating the same processes that are in place. Can you explain that a little more? To be more keen about really having the same process digitalized. So it, it's not really just about using the tools and the computer science and all this technology to make sure that we have the same process in the same way. That's paving the cow. That's basically repeating whatever you are doing always, but using different tools. The idea is really to have the opportunity to think whether these tools, whether these new digital streams will enable you to do your things differently. So you will achieve whatever you'd like to achieve, taking advantage of the tools, but taking advantage fully, not as a tools to be done, but probably to see if we could enhance, change the process itself. Thank you for that, Hanan. And I think that's very much what Ian is talking about, a need for a culture change, management change inside our corporations so that they understand that we have to shift our paradigm. We're not talking about replicating documents online. We're talking about a whole new digital way of approaching the movement of cargo around the world. David, I'll direct this question to you. It may have been answered by somebody in the chat room, but um, somebody asked, is um, something like Maersk's trade lens considered a, a pipeline? Uh, that is specifically a blockchain uh, linkage. Would you, would you call that a pipeline or how would it work within a pipeline? Yeah, I think um, there's a number of initiatives, uh, trade lens being one, uh, the Cargo Smarts GSBN, which is uh, available as well, and, and a few others that um, are following the pipeline principles. I think each pipeline's got its own characteristics, and obviously getting to that utopia position from, from data from the right source in every case is, is perfect, but it's not always achievable from the offset. So starting small, and, uh, and growing that information. But from what I understand of trade lens and what I've seen, it's it's following this process, it's capturing the information. So it's an aggregator, it's a private pipeline. So other pipelines are more public, um, which might be more open as well. So um, I think it just depends on your use case, but I would probably agree that trade lens and others are, are following these pipeline approaches and they're following standards and stuff as well, which is really important for interoperability. Thanks, David. I see in the chat room, there are some good answers that are posted there, so I don't want to take our time to repeat them. Uh, I noticed David Carden has a good ex uh, explanation of what can, smart containers can do. You may wish to look at that. Uh, Ian. Yes, go on. What, um, talking about the difficulties or the challenges within digitalization, you know, um, Standardization is a process that requires not only the technical expertise, but really bringing a lot of perspectives together in agreement. And I had to smile when I saw you referring to the World Customs Organization. You had spelled organization with a Z, and I've seen your other slides often spell it with an S. Uh, up here in Canada, we call things Z, Zs, and in the US, they call them Zs. And uh, all those S and Z words are in such need of standardization. We've never got to that. Can you just use that as an example of some of the issues that are needed to be a good diplomat in, in managing these collaborations? Well, um, Colin, it cost me another 15 minutes to turn everything to Zs from my native S's from this side of the world. So there was some lost time. Um, look, the work that goes on at CFACT, it has all manner of people there, and um, uh, I'm not promoting anything here. I'm just all manner of people from all sorts of disciplines and so forth. And the open development process and so forth that goes forward there does attempt to find a neutral, harmonized uh, 
semantic approach to things. And I think David got it very well with that spreadsheet he has up there that says you've got all these multimodal areas, but they're talking the same thing, even though they might be using different language. This is the important bit. What worries me is we've got the WCO, we've got the UNC factor, we've got GS1 and these others. And if you took their data models and put them on a Venn diagram, there'd be a level of overlap. And one of the things I'd love to see happen is that those levels of overlap be addressed with mappings of the two. So the Z equals is yes in this case, so forth. Because if we don't do it there, society's got to do it. And we've just dumped the cost of that down there. So that's something on my um, bucket list, if you like, in life to see whether that can happen. So thank you, Colin. And you just mentioned GS1. I, I wonder if you might explain to the audience, not everybody might know what they are responsible for. Okay. Global Systems One, an international organization. It's a not-for-profit. And when you go to the supermarket and buy a jar of something and it gets scanned at the checkout, that barcode and so forth, the standards and mechanisms coming from there. And that uh, is a, a huge alignment of what they're dealing with because they've done a lot about identity and uh, physical identity mapping to data. So that's what their world is about. So we are integrating barcodes with logistics and transport data. It's a great convergence. Uh, Hanan, there was a question about the cost of a container, a smart container. Um, I think it may have been answered online, but perhaps you can address that. Uh, Ken, is this something that a small or a medium-sized trader can afford to use? Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, I don't think the there is one price, it depends on the solution, it depends on the provider, it depends on the context. And uh, personally, I don't think any solutions, so I have no idea about the exact uh, prices that we are practicing today. But the idea is to be able to uh, make it accessible to everyone, and the standards would help that. If we are able to regenerate the data once, use that battery of the smart container once, and uh, share the data in standards format in an easy way, and share the cost, that definitely will make the smart container solution affordable and cheaper, regardless of the size of the, the company. And I think uh, small companies cannot afford not use the data. That's very, very important to their survival. That's very important to accelerate, enhance the collaboration with the other peers. Definitely, when you are a small uh, company, having the smart container data and that visibility will help you. Uh, in reducing your stocks will help you in accelerating your processes with uh, insurance claims, bank uh, payment release, etc. Thank you, Hanan. Approaching our end, uh, one interesting question came in um, of maybe uh, either David or Hernan or Ian, if you want to field this. Uh, somebody asked, can the smart container help me understand in addition to where my container is when it will arrive. And certainly um, congestion is the big issue in ports all around the world right now. So some of the physical aspects of congestion are managed in a different way, but can a data pipeline work to facilitate a problem like that? I will take the first part of the question if you'd like Ian about the smart container. Uh, definitely the estimated time for arrival is very, very important. And uh, this is a very uh, good example of my uh, one of the slides that I spoke of the productive services. So I think nobody's interested in having a little bubbles to say, where is my container? The real value is being able to know where my container will be arriving to that particular next uh, zone of interest. So it's the time of arrival is very key. And basically, if you have that productive services, Instead, instead of having that first come, uh, first served uh, approach, for example, in the port, you will be having a very clear um, appointment based on the estimated time of arrival, etc. A whole way of doing, and the smart container play an important role in the smart um, port concept and the smart city concept as well in that sense. So this is my two cents. Uh, probably, Ian, you want to bend on that? I can add to that. Um... You heard David talk about um, Jason LD and uh, moving and having data in these sorts of environments, the semantics environments that everybody can get at. We're talking here about data around the movement of goods and identification of the goods. But there's other data models and databases out there that are extremely important. The weather database, for instance, and also the traffic database. 
we need to get to the point with these pipelines where we're not only talking just about the data that we've got as we're moving stuff through. And obviously with the smart container, we know exactly where something is at a point in time, but we need to be able to look at other databases simultaneously to be able to do the projections about traffic across uh, road and so forth, or delays in shipping because of weather storms and so forth. So it's going to be a combination of the data that David was mentioning in the pipeline, plus the data that Canane is talking about from the physical goods, plus these other databases that we'll be able to access in this, now that we've got these pipelines happening and saying over the next 48 hours, this is going to happen. This is going to be a new ETA add another 24 hours because we've got this sort of situation in traffic or whatever. So I think that's what we're really looking at. And that's why I think we go back to the paving the cow phrase that uh, Hanain introduced to us and the uh, model I gave with uh, Einstein in there about simplification. We've really got to start getting to the boardroom with these opportunities and start to say, this is what we'd like to do and come back to the technologists and all of us trying to bring this technology forward and the standards to say, this is how we need to stitch it all together for this value. That's what I think we've got to do. I think that's a very good synopsis uh, to perhaps close on. David, did you want something to add? Yeah, just very briefly. I mean, if the whole point about the data pipelines is you've got the data that you can action and you can understand where things are in the supply chain. If we take a look at something that's happening right now, there's an evergreen ship that's blocking the Suez Canal. Yep. So very simply, I could look in um, my supply chain and look at the data to see which vessels I've got that are due within the next 10, 15 days. Those vessels are all using AIS transmitters. So we've got an IoT device on board the ship and it's very easy to track ships uh, online. Very uh, easy way to do that. And obviously if you've integrated a, an IoT ship tracking provider into your supply chain, you could identify any ships that are in the Suez Canal or en route to the Suez Canal and very easily identify what stock and inventory is going to be affected. And if it's relative to a promotion or a, a fast moving product, you could then switch to move stuff by air or um, perhaps book the next load onto a, a different route. So these, these are actionable insights really. And um, that's obviously limited to the ship and the sea part. Um, and I know we've got this in the rail community as well. And when you've got these sort of things on containers, it also allows you to do it end to end rather than parts of the supply chain. So I think that evergreen in the sh uh, ship canal is probably quite a good pertinent example that, that may affect people on the call today. Very good point, David. I think our time has come to a close. I'm going to thank Ian, David, Hanan, Siltna and Self International for this opportunity to let as many people around the world as possible know what is involved in the technology that is going to transform your lives as professionals in logistics and transport. Thank you for having us, uh, Colin. Thank you. I beg your pardon? Thank you for having us. Uh, Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I think that will have to close our meeting. Thank you all for attending. Look forward to another Siltna webinar in the future. Bye for now. Thank you.